Alright, it may not be the most exciting opening for a video, but picture this. Soft music notes drift slowly through a half-forgotten melody, somehow adding a bittersweet meaning to the peaceful countrysides that surround you as you explore them on foot. The hollow shell of a once great castle looms in the distance, smoke swirling overhead. Thick fog, tall grass, and towering mountains hide new discoveries around every corner. Some discoveries are friendly. Others are not. Eventually, the music drifts off and leaves only the sounds of rustling leaves and distant streams. It's tranquil, but the ever-present feeling of adventure and the notion of nearby danger never disappear. This is Hadmaro Fujibayashi in Shigeru Miyamoto's The Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild. Okay, second picture. A fantasy castle centers itself between six gateways leading to faraway lands. Through those gates, you might see a haunted gothic manor lurking in the hills like a crouching gargoyle. A futuristic city with transportation that never stops moving. A cruise that takes you through the very heart of the jungle. A stretching main street that transports its guests back to a golden age that might never have existed at all. And threading everything you see together is a sense of adventure and wondrous discovery that just doesn't belong in the real world. This is Walt Disney's Magic Kingdom. On the surface, it might not look like a video game centered on a crumbling fantasy empire and a theme park centered on rides and attractions could have that much in common. But when playing Breath of the Wild and when visiting Walt Disney World, I always feel the same emotions. Maybe it's because they both give me a glimpse of what heaven would be like in their own way. But I think there's also something more tangible that connects the two together. <clears throat> anyway, let's rewind a bit though. You just stuck with me through probably the slowest opening sequence of a video I've ever made. What are we doing here anyway? Okay, so I've never been a very hardcore video games guy. I mean, Minecraft was always pretty great. Protect Sven at all costs. Oh, and um, the, the dog fight thing on Wii Sports Resort. Pretty, pretty underrated. Until recently, though, that was about as far as it got. But dude, Disney World. I've been a fan of that since I was, like, a sperm. This is me in the Magic Kingdom when I was 8. When I was 14. When I was 16. Oh, and this is a few weeks ago. I've also become pretty obsessed with bidding on vintage Disney World memorabilia. So... You know, if you ever wonder where those Patreon dollars go. Boom! Epcot Guidebook from 1982. Boom! 1957 Tom Sawyer Island Map. Boom! 1955 Opening Year Disneyland Postcards. The only thing I love almost as much as Walt Disney World is probably this little game called The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. It's a game that was hailed by critics as one of Nintendo's very best. It's the top-selling Zelda game of all time. And it's my favorite game, which isn't really saying much since, as we've mentioned, I, I am no gamer boy. I mean, heck, I liked the new Battlefront game. My opinions aren't exactly highbrow. But to get straight to the point, I think the reason Breath of the Wild connects with me and many others so heavily is that the video game designers who created the open world map of Zelda took a ton of inspiration from the Imagineers of Disney theme parks. Some of this inspiration comes down to imagery and simple visual parallels. Other stuff is more theoretical, the design and storytelling principles that guide the player through the game in the first place. So today, I want to explore some of those similarities. Throughout this episode, I'm going to be including some excerpts from my interview with an actual Imagineer named Mel McGowan. Mel was involved in lots of urban planning for downtown Disney and the resorts in California, and he had tons of brilliant insight to offer about both sides of the video. We're going to get his take on the Disney Zelda parallels. We're going to chart the connection between theme parks and games. We're going to show clips of me absolutely failing at everything. <laughs> it's going to be great. So, you know, strap in. Because things are going to get wild. B B Breath of the Wild. So for the purposes of this video, I'm going to assume you're familiar with at least the basics of Zelda and the basics of Disney World. I don't want to bore you with stuff you already know. Long story short, though, 
Breath of the Wild is widely considered to be one of the greatest open world games ever created. And that's partly because it takes the series back to its roots and puts the emphasis on exploration, just like the original Legend of Zelda did. The first Zelda game was pretty open worldy from the get go. Shigeru Miyamoto has frequently mentioned his childhood growing up in the country and exploring the nearby forests as the inspiration for a game where the prime goal was exploration. In 1988, the OG Legend of Zelda's map was one of the largest ever created, and the game was a smash hit because of the ways it promoted a choose-your-own-adventure approach. So exploration was a pretty key driver behind the Legend of Zelda's success, and 30 years later, it's the driver behind Breath of the Wild's success too. The main thing Breath of the Wild has that the original game didn't have is immersion. As you'd expect, the difference between three decades of advancement in game technology is... <sighs> Striking. Breath of the Wild's world ain't made out of pixels anymore. This world is practically photorealistic and often jaw-droppingly beautiful, while still maintaining the anime-inspired cartoonishness of previous installments. Of course, the immersion doesn't just come from how the world looks, but also from how the player can move through it. The biggest joys in Breath of the Wild often come from the fact that if the player sees a place in the distance they'd like to go, it might take a while, but they can undoubtedly get there, be it by riding horseback, taking a boat, or jumping off a tower and gliding. So Breath of the Wild is an extremely immersive game, chiefly because of the freedom it provides players to do things their way and go where they want to go without feeling like the digital world has walls around it. It's often been said that if something looks like it should work in Breath of the Wild, it probably will. And the experience is so captivating because every choice serves to further immerse the player inside the explorative environment. So how does any of this connect to theme park design or Disney World? Bear with me. Walt Disney's Magic Kingdom opened in Orlando, Florida in 1971, 16 years after the original Disneyland opened in California. Walt Disney World is quickly approaching its 50th anniversary, with loads of additions being made to the parks over the next few years. The biggest of these additions is the soon-to-open Star Wars Land, aka Walt Disney Presents Disney's Lucasfilm's Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. If we're talking about immersion and video games, Galaxy's Edge has a slice of both. The land was created to be a hyper-immersive environment where instead of knowing you're in a theme park, you feel like you've been transported to a planet in the Star Wars universe, which was something Star Wars fans could only really do through video games up till now. And some of the attractions have their roots in gaming too. The Millennium Falcon ride, which has had its fans and its critics already, has basically been summed up by both groups as an ultra-realistic interactive video game. Disney's commitment to immersion, theming, and experiential entertainment goes back far before Star Wars was even around. I mean, really before even video games were around. I'm sure you know this, but ever since Disneyland's opening in 1955, themed portions of the parks like Frontierland, Tomorrowland, and Fantasyland were being created to teleport their guests to another time and place altogether. The iconic the iconic plaque on the entrance to Disneyland, after all, has always read, Here you leave today, and enter the world of yesterday, tomorrow, and fantasy. Since then, Disney's transportive worlds have only continued to expand in scale. From the World Showcase at Epcot, which transports guests to 11 different countries around the globe, all the way to Pandora, the world of Avatar in Animal Kingdom, which constructs an alien realm of floating mountains and bioluminescent plants to immerse travelers in the highest grossing film of all time. Wait a minute. Oh? Oh! Joe Rohde, the legendary Imagineer behind Pandora and Expedition Everest, talked about this continually evolving focus on immersion in 2017, connecting the experience to video games. I do believe we've entered an era, and I think it may be because of gaming, where the expectation is no longer the expectation of a proscenium, but rather the expectation of a dome. The expectation that the story does surround me. If I turn my head, I'm still in the story. And that, I think, is where we are now arriving, in a world of world creation where you can enter and you're free to look wherever you please, and we will sustain you and keep you inside of a story, because it surrounds you. Rhodey's comments are pretty revealing. Disney has always been focused on transporting guests to another time, another place, or another world. But they're zero in on sheer 360-degree immersion, where the guest completely forgets they're in a theme park at all? 
That element has been pretty recent. Rhodey notes, of course, that this may have stemmed from gaming, but the massively immersive Wizarding World of Harry Potter at Universal definitely had something to do with it too. Alright, so we've covered some of the basic bases of Zelda and Disney so far. Zelda is a wildly popular open world video game that focuses on transporting and immersing its players in a fantasy realm that they can explore at their own pace. Disney World is a theme park empire that has always been about transporting its guests to another place, but has recently become more concerned with total immersion and exploration than ever before. From here on out, we're going to focus specifically on comparing Breath of the Wild to the Magic Kingdom in Orlando. Why not the original Disneyland or some other more recent park? Well, not to get into the whole debate, but to me, the Magic Kingdom is everything people love about Disney as a whole, distilled into one perfected open space vision. Consequently, it's also the most visited theme park in the world, so it just makes sense to hold it up against the most successful Zelda title of all time. Let's get going. Former Imagineer Don Carson once stressed that the best video games and the best theme parks have three things in common. They let you be someone you could never be, they let you go somewhere you could never go, and they let you do something you could never do. To a certain extent, video games like Breath of the Wild and theme parks like the Magic Kingdom are designed to accomplish similar goals of escapism in completely different ways. So, do designing open world games and designing theme parks require some of the same skill sets? Imagineer Mel McGowan had some thoughts. Well, yeah, I mean, that's definitely, you know, I think, something I've been pushing, the, the whole integration, you know, and, and I think it's already happened in some of the emerging, you know, entertainment design programs, where it's a clear understanding that, um, you know, even, I mean, at the simplest level, just simply production design, you know, it, it's definitely literally the same skill set. Um, whether you're designing stuff uh, that will only ever appear digitally, whether they're, you know, conceptual drawings for a, a themed land, whether it's production design for a film. It might be pretty self-evident, but video games and theme parks both employ tons of design expertise, be it in the artistic touches that make the world come to life, or in the geographical planning that helps guide the player or guest through that world. Starting now, we're going to be zeroing in on three specific overarching principles employed by both the Magic Kingdom and Breath of the Wild to guide and immerse their audiences in their world. And I guess we might as well start with the first way, something Imagineers like Mel would call environmental or spatial storytelling. For both Disney and Zelda, the biggest draw of going to the park or playing the game comes from experiencing the world they create. People love fighting enemies or doing the dungeons in Zelda, but the one thing you'll hear fans rave about the most in Breath of the Wild that they don't with other Zelda games is just the fun of exploring the world itself. I'll tell you something, they're not there for the shrine challenges. Likewise, Disney has rides and attractions and people love them, but for me at least, the real draw of the parks is just being there and taking it all in. It's a magical place where everything is just more idealized and whimsical and lighthearted than anywhere else. So, for both, the setting is an attraction and character in and of itself, and it might just be THE character. Of course, neither Disney or Zelda constructs a world without also infusing a narrative within that world through the implications of the production design and visuals. Disney has always prioritized the theming and backstory of its attractions, and they're known for the way they allow the guests to gather the narrative as they go along. Mel emphasized this point really strongly. You know, I, I did an article, I think, in Themed Attraction, it's just on backstory. It, it, to me, it's not about, uh, you know, flowery writing or, you know, or naming or any of that. It, it's really more the idea of, of, before you just start drawing and visualizing, the notion of um, taking the time to really work through kind of internal logic and someone to, to really kind of create that, that genesis story of, how did this ever come to be? Telling a story through the production design and visuals is essentially what every attraction at Disney does, with dark rides being the chiefest among them. The Haunted Mansion feels like an old house that's been around forever, with gravestones for people like Master Gracie and portraits of the old residents in life. It plays as if there are countless mysterious and untold stories that we're only seeing snippets from, and endless details to gather every time you ride it. Even something as simple as Big Thunder Mountain has the implied backstory of an old mining town cursed with natural disasters. And of course, all the attractions based on movies have the movie as their narrative, from the Seven Dwarfs Mine Train to the Monster's Laugh Floor. 
Maybe the best example of environmental storytelling and an implied narrative comes from Pandora the World of Avatar, where the remains of the RDA's mechanical deforestation can still be seen in the periphery, but they're being overtaken once again by the plants and Na'vi culture that has been restored to the environment. The land tells a very clear story of the natural world fighting back against its oppressors, and the more you explore, the more about that story you discover. You know, I think the, the, one of the reasons and Pandora is a great example that it's not just some guy throwing stupid, you know, just, hey, I've got floating islands and, you know, waterfalls in the sky, you know, the, yeah. you know there's, there's a, again, there is a backstory, there's an internal logic to it, even though it's beautiful either way, the thing that makes it just believable is that, that idea of this historical origin story that, you know, kind of pulls it all together, you know. Like Disney's attractions, which infuse a backstory into their narrative and tell that story through the theming, the vast wasteland of Breath of the Wild is not an empty, generic, and untouched wilderness without any tales to tell. In a way vaguely reminiscent of the Pevensey children's return to a post-war Narnia in Prince Caspian, the land you're exploring is the kingdom of Hyrule a hundred years after an apocalyptic event. And the environment tells that story, and lots of other smaller ones, through the implications of the production design and visuals. There's an unspoken narrative, a dramatic backstory that has occurred off screen, and as the player we get to connect the dots of what once was as we explore and discover how Hyrule's downfall took place. From the ruins of old mills and villages we find destroyed by Ganon, to the rusty and mechanical guardians who used to defend the castle from evil, but since the war have turned to defend it from you. In Imagineer Marty Sklar's guide for his fellow theme park designers called Mickey's Ten Commandments, one of the principles he stresses is to communicate with visual literacy, to use imagery and design to tell a story and communicate to the guest how they're supposed to feel. Breath of the Wild and Disney both do this beautifully, rarely relying on exposition and information dumps, but rather illustrating their narratives through the world they construct, letting you pick things up as they go. The two also communicate with something I'd have to call musical literacy, using seamless music transitions to atmospherically immerse the guest in each environment, but due to the copyrighted nature of the music, I'm not going to try to use examples. Believe it or not, there are several more parallels between Zelda and Disney World. We've talked about how both immerse their guests in a story through their environment, but the principles they use to guide people through those environments are where the commonalities really show up. Let's dive a little deeper. Alright, so we talked about Marty Sklar's Imagineering Commandments earlier, and as it happens, our second principle of immersion is grounded in one of these commandments. Sklar said, tell one story at a time. If you have a lot of information, divide it into distinct, logical, organized stories. So, uh, I think the payoff to this rule in the Magic Kingdom should be pretty obvious. For one thing, individual rides tell their own separate, self-contained stories and create variety. But on a grander scale, how can you not mention the lands? Main Street, Tomorrowland, Fantasyland, Liberty Square, Frontierland, Adventureland. Each land branches off from the central hub of Cinderella's castle, and each land tells its story in a simple and distinct way. Mel talks about how this came from Disney's expertise on urban and city planning. So one of his elements, for example, was the idea of districts. We automatically want to break the city into some different bite-sized zones or chunks. And of course, lands are the, the best example of that. Yeah. It's not just a 100-acre autonomy, you know, amusement zone. Uh, you have these nice bite-sized chunks, you know, 5 to 12-acre lands that you can, you can know when you're entering, exiting these different diegetic realities. So, the Magic Kingdom's lands allow you to feel like there's room to explore, but they also make sure the map isn't too overwhelming and still feels divided into easy-to-grasp segments. Even cities like New York do this with their various neighborhoods and boroughs. The lands at Disney create a unified whole, but when you're immersed in each one, you don't have any hint of the others. When you're riding the Haunted Mansion in Liberty Square, you're actually right next to It's a Small World in Fantasyland, but you'd never know it. That's telling one story at a time, that's variety, and that's immersion. Now, anybody know how this applies to Breath of the Wild? Regions! Biomes! Breath of the Wild similarly breaks down its huge map into smaller, separately themed environments with different aesthetics and stories to tell. Being at the top of the mountain in the Lanayru region feels totally different than running through the desert sands of the Gerudo region. Getting lost in the Korok Forest in the Woodland region contrasts a ton with looking out from the top of Goron City in the Akala region. There are forests, plains, jungles, deserts, 
marshes, beaches, rocky cliffs, and volcanoes. Many of the regions also have varying villages with different missions to accomplish in each one. And there are the four main story quests to take back the Divine Beasts, which further help to categorize the map with various separate adventures. And that's kind of the beauty of Breath of the Wild and of the Magic Kingdom. These are places that were created to be explored and discovered and even to willingly get lost in but they never sacrifice the overall legibility of their maps in the process. It's still easy to orient yourself and take things section by section. And that brings us to one of the final pieces of the puzzle, a little thing called weenies. The third principle of immersion that Disney and Zelda have in common is rooted once again in the commandments of Marty Sklar. They're really that good. One of Sklar's most well-known commandments is create a weenie. Lead visitors from one area to another by adding visual magnets and giving them rewards for making the journey. For all intents and purposes, the visual magnet we're talking about here is usually a tall and appealing structure that people can see from a long distance away. According to Disney historian Jim Corcus, Walt called these weenies because they reminded him of how his dogs would follow him anywhere whenever he held a hot dog over their heads. Similarly, a weenie in a theme park is a structure that people will be attracted to and guided by for one reason or another. This principle is most widely applied to the Magic Kingdom as a whole because of the park's prominent and memorable use of the iconic Cinderella Castle right in the very center of the map as an anchor point for guests. The castle is brilliant for a number of reasons. The most well-known one is that it's a beloved visual that people love to take photos in front of. It uses forced perspective to look bigger than it is, it's inviting and kind of awe-inspiring just to look at, and when the fireworks go off, in front of the castle is where you want to be to see them. But beyond being a famous piece of Disney iconography, the castle also serves as a compass, a constant structure that guests can almost always see from anywhere in the park. This is why parents tell their kids to meet them back at the castle if they ever get separated. And it's why Disney lights up the castle every night around closing time, to draw guests back toward the entrance like moths to a flame. Walt Disney, always the urban planning geek, designed his park using a hub and spokes model, with the different lands fanning out from the castle in the very center. What he brought was this, again, perfect balance orchestration because having that central hub and being able to return to this neutral zone, this peaceful plaza, you know, in the middle and to get your bearings and to know where you've been and where you want to go. It's kind of like C.S. Lewis talks about the wood between worlds. Mm, yeah. Um, and so that, that, there's power to that so that you wouldn't feel lost, and disoriented, frustrated, and mad. Um, but again, the, the cool thing is that, man, you could be on that canoe behind the rivers of America and totally feel, you know, not only uh, miles away from the Interstate 5 freeway, but also miles away from that central formal plaza hub. You know, yeah. the same thing, Jungle Cruise. You're just, you know, 100 yards away, but you feel completely lost in the back alleys and the jungles of that world. So Disney heavily emphasizes the ability to explore at your leisure and get immersed and lost in an environment. But structures like Cinderella Castle serve to keep the immersion from becoming overwhelming and impossible to navigate. This clearly encapsulates the purpose of Cinderella Castle well, and most people are aware that every Disney park has an iconic centerpiece that both serves as a guide and sets an aesthetic tone. Many people forget, however, that the individual lands of the Magic Kingdom also have their own weenies presiding over them, too. Each section of the park has a high point, so you can get your bearings. Adventureland has the Enchanted Tiki Room, visible from anywhere in its borders and building on that tropical vibe. Tomorrowland has Space Mountain, which can be seen from even outside the park. Frontierland has Splash Mountain, which can be seen from almost anywhere and quickly attracts people in its direction. See, weenies help orient guests, but they also help Disney by drawing people into areas that might not get as many crowds otherwise. Anyway, I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. Breath of the Wild similarly uses visual magnets or weenies to guide players both on the map as a whole and within each region of that map. If you hadn't noticed by now, one of the most obvious visual similarities between this game and Disney World is that, well, you know, they both have a giant fantasy castle right in the center of their map. Zelda's castle is visible from just about anywhere in Hyrule, sinisterly looming in the distance as an ever-present reminder of the threat posed by Ganon that must be stopped. And as you activate the Divine Beasts, the beams of light they aim at the castle subconsciously point you in the direction of the final boss for the rest of the game. 
Like its theme park counterpart, however, Breath of the Wild also contains other visual magnets within its individual regions, Sheikah Towers. In every one of the regions in Breath of the Wild, 15 of them in total, a massive tower must be scaled to reach the top and unlock a map of the area. Many open world video games use this concept of reaching checkpoints that contain portions of the map to fill in, but Breath of the Wild also uses its towers as weenies to guide the player at all times. Almost any time in the game, no matter where you are, you can look off into the distance and see one or multiple towers guiding your way to whichever region you'd like to head toward next. And when you finally reach a tower, you can climb it and get the benefit of seeing things from a bird's eye view. The concept is pretty effective in keeping the player looking off to the horizon for their next adventure, and it undoubtedly plays into that feeling of exploration so many have praised the game for achieving. Fundamentally, Breath of the Wild is a game that has to balance the joys of exploration with a map that is navigable and easy to orient yourself within. With the help of environmental storytelling, distinct regions that break the land into bite-sized chunks, and Disney-style weenies that guide the player's sightlines whenever they head in any direction, this balance is achieved beautifully. Breath of the Wild and the Magic Kingdom feature worlds that are more than mere backdrops, but actually embody their origins in a more tangible and crystallized way than ever before. The Magic Kingdom tells the story of its creator, Walt Disney. Tomorrowland epitomizes Walt's optimism for the future and quest for progress. Main Street embodies his idealism and nostalgia for the golden age of America. Liberty Square represents his desire to educate young people on the origins of their country. Fantasyland reflects his imagination and fondness for fairy tales. Walking through the park is like walking through the mind of Walt Disney himself, and that's why I love it. The Kingdom of Hyrule and Breath of the Wild always tells a story. A story of a land in need of a hero, a story of the villagers and regular people who have been displaced by war, and a story of the natural world's conflict with human invention and technology. This video set out to explain the connections between how a game and a theme park successfully immerse their audiences in another world, allowing them to explore and adventure within that world without losing the heart and soul of the narrative. It's cheesy, but I think that's ultimately where the two cross over the most, heart and soul. Whether Breath of the Wild's game developers consciously imitated Imagineering principles or not, the thing they nailed that Disney also nails is an environment where you can feel the passion of the creators bleeding through. And that is what makes both of these escapist experiences universal. All right, thanks a million to Imagineer Mel McGowan for agreeing to be interviewed for this video. If you want to read more of his insights, I've got a document linked below with more of the full transcript. If you're a Zelda kind of guy, or gal, and you made it to the end of this video, I want to hear your favorite Zelda game down below. If you're a Disney kind of gal, or guy, I want to hear your favorite Disney park down below. All right, you know the drill. Thank you to my patrons. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Sure.